Welcome to another episode of The Chef Educator, the show that provides and discusses various teaching tools, tips, and techniques for the culinary, hospitality, and pastry arts educator. And now, coming to you through the airways from Palm Beach County, Florida, here is your host, doctor, professor, and chef, Mr. Colin Rowe. Hello, everyone, and good day. Welcome to today's episode of The Chef Educator Podcast which is titled Memory and Learning. My name is Dr. Colin Roach, and I am your host. Now, before we start in on today's topic, I want to give our new listeners a little background information on the podcast. The Chef Educator Podcast is a proud member of the Food Media Network and was created to be a comprehensive resource for both new and veteran culinary, hospitality, and baking and pastry arts teachers, instructors, and faculty at both secondary and post-secondary educational institutions. Our hope is to offer you a collection of practical and effective teaching tools, tips, and techniques that can be used in your culinary classroom or lab. And here is our big ask. If you enjoy this episode or the Chef Educator podcast overall, Please be part of keeping these resources free while also helping to support the creation of future resources by making a donation through our Patreon or our Buy Me a Cup of Coffee links. And they are www.patreon.com slash drprofessorchef or www.buymeacoffee.com slash chefroach. If you contribute just the price of a coffee a month, you will be helping to support the hosting, purchasing, creation, and production of our shows, episodes, and all of the educational materials we produce and give away for free. Again, those links are www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Dr. Professor Chef or www buymeacoffee.com slash Chef Roach, which will also leave both of these links in the show description as well. We truly appreciate any amount of support that you can provide, and I personally thank you in advance for your help. Okay, so today I want to talk about what memory is and how it relates to the learning process. And a few of the books I will be referencing that I highly recommend you read if you want more info on the topic is Brain Matters by Patricia Wolf, Understanding by Design Meets Neuroscience, and that's by Jay Matigny and Judy Willis, and The New Science of Learning, How to Learn in Harmony with Your Brain by Terry Doyle and Todd Zakaresic, Karasic. I'm going to slaughter in that name. Sorry, Todd. And Brain-Based Teaching in the Digital Age by Mary Lee Sprenger. So I'll put these books information in the show notes down below in case you want to look those up or you're driving, didn't have a chance to really grab those. So let's get started. We commonly think of memory as a thing. And we talk about how poor our memory is or how much better someone else's memory is. And when it comes to education, we often think of the rote memorization of information as a poor practice. Well, if we view memory as nothing more than simply remembering or memorizing information, it may seem to be a very narrow topic to have a podcast episode about. However, if we think about what life would be like without memory, our perception may change somewhat. Because What makes us unique, and to a large degree, what determines who we become, is our ability to acquire and store new information. And out of that ability comes new concepts, new ideas, new feelings, and ultimately our behaviors. In other words, memory is what enables us to learn by experience. In fact, memory is essential to survival. Without the ability to learn, store, and recall how we should respond to the environmental dangers and to know when and how to run or fight, an individual has little chance of survival. Seen in this light, an understanding of memory becomes virtually important to us as parents and educators. 
There is really only a small formal distinction between learning and memory. The two are so inextricably linked that a study of one becomes a study of the other. Human memory is invisible and intangible. Therefore, we must consider it a process and not a thing. We have historically described memory in terms of metaphors, and over time, two major metaphors have evolved. One views memory as a kind of intellectual muscle, and that the more you use it, the stronger it becomes. According to this view, the hours spent memorizing school notes, lines of poetry, important dates, different phrases, will strengthen the mind and makes it better or better able to remember other kinds of material. Well, this is not necessarily true. In fact, extensive memorization may even decrease the brain's ability to memorize additional information. Another popular metaphor from memory has its origins in the writing of Plato, who likened the human mind to a tablet of wax on which impressions are made. In this view, rehearsing experiences or information strengthens or deepens the impression, resulting in information that is more easily remembered. While this metaphor may seem to fit with many of our experiences, like when we practice the multiplication tables or the rules of spelling, such as the I before E that we all know, it doesn't explain why we have vivid recollections of emotional events we experienced only once, or why, when we rehearse all items in a list equally, we remember the first and last items more readily than those in the middle. It appears that the reason for remembering and forgetting are more complex than simple repetition of experiences. Psychiatrist Daniel Siegel proposes the following example, which points to this complexity. Imagine that someone asks you to picture the Eiffel Tower in your mind's eye. This person's voice creates sound waves, like I just did to you that vibrate the tympanic membranes in your ears, and those sound waves, in turn, are transformed into electrical impulses by the organ of corti and forwarded to your temporal lobes for decoding. Next, the information is sent to your occipital lobes for visual processing. The inputs from those two parts of the brain are integrated, and you are able to, quote-unquote, see the Eiffel Tower in your mind or in your imagination. Siegel states that when this happens, what you're actually doing is reactivating a neural network that was previously established when you saw the Eiffel Tower or a picture of it for the first time. Now, while I was just saying that to you, I am relatively certain that you actually, that you, while listening, saw the Eiffel Tower. And if you ever been to Paris and actually viewed this landmark in person, like I did a few summers ago with my family, in all probability, I bet you also recalled some other things related to your visit, such as the weather and the people you were with. You may have even heard some of the sounds you heard that day. It is interesting that when you recall a visual image of something you previously viewed, you are activating many of the same neural networks that were activated originally. In 1949, visionary psychologist David Hebb proposed a similar theory in his book titled The Organization of Behavior. He proposed that neurons that fire together simultaneously are more likely to fire together again in the future. Siegel colorfully rephrased what is known as Hebb's Law or Hebb's Law when he states, neurons that fire together, survive together, and wire together. Now, many neuroscientists concur that this is probably the psychological basis for memory. Experience changes the way synaptic connections are made and increases the probability of firing in a predictable association with other neurons. So now I want to talk about sensory memory for a while. Everything in our memory begins as a sensory input from the environment. The role of sensory memory is to take the information coming into the brain through sensory receptors and hold it for a fraction of a second until a decision is made about what to do with it. This process is pretty straightforward. For example, 
a light ray hits the retina of your eye and forms a brief memory, which we'll call an iconic memory, which lasts only milliseconds. It is probably best understood as a prolongation of the original stimulus trace required to allow time for recognition and further processing to take place. According to Joseph Turgeson, who's a professor at Florida State University, the same is probably true with the other senses. One exception, however, may be auditory stimuli. Auditory signals are recorded briefly in what is usually referred to as the echonic memory. This is, there's some evidence that echonic or echonic traces may last a little longer, perhaps as long as 20 seconds. But even though the process seems relatively simple, this sensory input does not arrive one piece at a time as separate bits of information. Rather, it arrives simultaneously. During any fractional moment in time, an enormous amount of sensory stimuli bombards our bodies, giving us much more information than we can possibly comprehend. Think about it. If you are consciously aware of all the images, sounds, tactile sensations, tastes, and smells that simultaneously blast down upon our bodies, we would experience sensory overload. Without some mechanism to organize these raw sensory data into meaningful patterns, we would not be able to function. Sensory memory then filters the enormous amount of information we experience through our senses and discards the irrelevant data. This is pretty efficient if you think about it. Now, the brain is sometimes referred to as a sponge that soaks up information, but I think a better metaphor might be a sieve because by some estimate, 99% of all sensory information is discarded almost immediately upon entering the brain. The reason that the brain filters out such vast amounts of information is because much of it is irrelevant. There would normally be little functional or survival value in remembering, say, what your clothes feel like on your body a few minutes ago or how a pen felt in your hand when you were writing something a week ago. The question we must consider, though, is how the brain decides what to keep and what to discard. What factors influence the brain to pay attention to certain stimuli and not others? So let's look at this a little closer, how these sensory signals go into perception. Because All information received by sensory receptors needs to be sent to the appropriate sensory cortex to be processed. Now, as you may remember from previous podcast episodes that I did on the mind and how learning works, the organ that plays a major role in this transfer is the thalamus. Now, all sensory data, except smells, travel to the thalamus first. And smells don't do this because they're received and processed simultaneously by the olfactory bulb and therefore do not need to be relayed to any other part of the brain for processing. But the other sites have to go through this thalamus so it can send it to places. So from there, the data are relayed to the specific portions of the cortex designed to process sight, sound, taste, or touch. And now a discussion of the complex physiology by which this method is or happens is kind of beyond the scope of this episode, but just know it kind of divides them up and puts them into their areas that they need to go to. So it's important to understand that as information travels from the sensory receptors to the site where it is processed, it is in a sense transformed. It changes from a photon of light or a sound wave into a percept. In other words, we do not see the photon of light or the sound wave per se, but rather we perceive a figure or we perceive a sound. And the perception is uniquely shaped by that perceiving mind at that moment. This is going to be key as we get a little further into this. Perception refers to the meaning we attach to information as it is received through our senses. Our eyes may capture an image in much the same way as a camera does, but what we see or perceive is influenced by the other information we have stored in our brains, our perception of what we're seeing. Let me give you an example. Think about if you were looking on a piece of paper of the letter or the capital B, right? The letter B is a capital. 
If you were asked what number that is, you would probably say 13 because it looks like, you know, the number three stuck to the number one. It gives us that capital B. Yet if you were asked to name the letter, you would probably answer B. Well, the figure on the paper didn't change. It was your perception that changed based on what you were asked and your existing knowledge of numbers and letters. Now think about this from a young child's point of view. To a young child with no stored information of either numbers or letters, this would be a meaningless mark on a piece of paper and wouldn't make any sense to them. So the assignment of meaning to incoming stimuli therefore depends on prior knowledge and on what we expect to see. In a sense, the brain checks existing neural networks of information to see if the new information that's coming in is something that activates a previously stored neural network. This matching of a new input to stored information is called pattern recognition and is a critical aspect of attention. Pattern recognition works so well that you would be able to recognize a letter, whether it is printed as a capital B, a small b, or even a b that's written in cursive writing. However, if you had never seen the letter b before and did not know what it represented, it would be meaningless no matter what it looked like because there would be no recognition or match. So I'll say it again, the assignment of meaning to incoming stimuli depends on prior knowledge and on what we expect to see. Okay, I want to take a quick pause here at this halfway point in the show to tell you about what I think is a great resource for the culinary or hospitality teacher. And that is a book titled Culinary Educators Teaching Tools and Tips that's published by Kendall Hunt. I co-wrote this comprehensive resource specifically for the new and the seasoned educator, and it's written in an easy-to-understand style with numerous charts, templates, and examples throughout, and you can get it in both electronic and in hard copies for around $40. Well, if you're interested, you can get more information on this book as well as purchase a copy through either Amazon or or the publisher's Kendall Hunt's website at www.kendallhunt.com. That's K-E-N-D-A-L-L-H-U-N-T. And of course, I'm going to leave the link to this in the episode's description, so you can check that out later if you'd like. And if you do buy it, I'd love to get some feedback on it and tell me what you think. Okay, now back to the episode. So let's go a little further from perception now to attention, because children are often criticized for not paying attention, but this is actually an impossible task. The brain is always paying attention to something. What we really mean when we say this is that children do not pay attention to what we think is relevant or important. Attention, as we all know, is selective. So what are the factors that influence whether a stimulus is kept or dropped? Why is it that two people can experience the same sensory input, but they each attend to totally different elements of the input? Well, it's important to be aware that in the initial processing stage, we are not talking about a consciously driven process. Though it is true, with conscious effort, you were able to direct and sustain your attention on a specific stimulus, this is not the case most of the time. It would be inefficient and perhaps impossible to consciously determine what you are going to focus on at every given moment. The brain is constantly scanning the environment for stimuli, a process done largely by automatic mechanisms. As you may recall from previous episodes in this podcast, the reticular activating system, which is also known as the RAS, plays an important role in filtering thousands of stimuli and excluding trivial information and focusing on relevant data. In other words, your unconscious brain is usually in control of the initial decision-making process for you. So now let's ask the question, what factors then influence the brain during this initial filtering of information? How does the brain determine what is relevant and what is not? 
Well, one key co- component in the filtering process is whether the incoming stimulus is different from what we're used to seeing, you know, whether it is novel. Novelty is an innate attention getter. To survive, our remote ancestors had to be aware of any novel or unique stimuli present in the environment. We are not much different. Our brains are still programmed to pay attention to the unusual, such as, say, a detour sign along a familiar route we're driving along. Now, as teachers, we often take advantage of this phenomenon by providing information in a surprising or novel manner. For example, you know, maybe in some grade school classes, you might come dressed up in a costume of a historical character, or in science, maybe give students balloons to introduce a lesson on air pressure. I teach cost control, and I once introduced a lesson on recipe costing by having the class, students in the class, make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I use that to illustrate the importance of following standardized recipes. Now, with that said, the word eventually gets out. They all expect it's going to be coming. Therefore, novelty is difficult for a teacher to employ on a daily basis to obtain students' attention. And that reason is called habituation. You know, it becomes a habit. If a sight or a sound is new and unusual, we initially pay close attention to it. But if that same sight or sound occurs over and over and over, the brain normally becomes so accustomed to the stimulus that it ignores it. Here's an example of habituation. If you ever lived near an airport, right, chances are you reached a point where you seldom paid attention to the plane's landing and taking off. Of course, you didn't, you couldn't avoid hearing the jet taking off. But after that same sound is continually repeated on a daily basis, it is no longer novel and becomes filtered out by the sensory system as unimportant. Same thing happens if you live next to a highway or train tracks. This is why the tactic of flicking the light switch on and off that some teachers do to get the student's attention eventually loses its effectiveness. The students have become habituated to the flickering light, and hence don't pay any attention to it. Now, the intensity of the stimuli is another facet that affects attention. Generally, the louder a sound or the brighter a light, the more likely it is to draw attention. And when two stimuli are competing for attention, the one that is more intense or the most intense will attract attention first. And advertisers take advantage of this phenomenon by increasing the volume of television commercials to get your attention. This is something I hate. You know, you got the show just at the right volume and then commercial comes on. It's like, why is the TV so loud? Well, they do this because that's they know this neuroscience. Now, a third factor that influences attention is movement. In general, our attention is directed towards stimuli that move. The illusion of movement can be produced by blinking neon signs that attract attention more readily than signs that do not blink. And other things would be the flashing lights on a police car or an ambulance would be another example of movement as an attention-getting device. So at this point, we are talking about the processing that takes place during the initial presentation of stimuli to the sensory receptors. This processing is largely unconscious and, for the most part, out of our control. However, as we have seen, it is possible to influence what the brain pays attention to by using novelty, intensity, or movement. Now, in the classroom, unfortunately, it is probable that none of these will prove useful over time because of habituation. You know, as I mentioned, flickering the light switch to get students' attention may work well the first few times, but with extended use, students will fail to notice or even respond to this signal. In the same vein, raising your voice level may get attention for a while, but it often results in students just raising their own voice levels to match yours. A novel event is obviously only novel for a short period of time. Well, so does this mean that teachers and parents have little influence on what their students' or children's brains focus on? Are we at the mercy of impulsive and unpredictable brains that resist all efforts to get it to focus on a particular stimuli? No, we are not. Two factors strongly influence whether the brain initially attends to arriving information and whether this attention will be sustained. These two factors are meaning and emotion, and we do, as teachers or parents, have some control over them. So let's talk about them. 
Earlier, I mentioned pattern recognition, which describes how the brain attempts to match incoming sensory stimuli with information that is already stored in circuits or networks of neurons. In other words, the neural networks check out sensory stimuli as soon as they enter the brain to see if they form a familiar pattern. If they do, a match occurs and the brain determines that this new visual stimuli are familiar. In that case, the new information makes sense or has meaning. Now, what happens if there is no match? Well, the brain may attend to the meaningless information for a short time because it's novel. But if it can make no sense out of the incoming stimuli, the brain will probably not process the information further. This is something we see with our students in class. Think about the following situation. You're sitting in a doctor's office waiting for an appointment. You pick up a magazine in the waiting room and discover that it's written in a language you don't read. Say it's in Japanese. What do you do? Well, you'd probably put the magazine down rather quickly, right? And look around for something else to read that you can understand. Now, imagine that you're trying to read a document full of, say, complex charts and graphs and formulas that make no sense to you. Well, sustained attention to something you can't comprehend is not only boring, it's almost impossible. And I'm afraid that all too often we expect such a feat from our children and our students. Therefore, sustained attention to something a person can't comprehend is not only boring, it's impossible. We cannot reconstruct a reactivating neural circuit or network if it has never been activated in the first place. So we can now begin to understand the concept of meaning in the important role it plays in attention. If the brain cannot find any previously activated networks into which the new information fits, it is much less likely to pay attention to this information. Think about it. Our species has not survived by attending to and storing meaningless information. So going back to students in our classrooms, consider if they're confronted with information that doesn't match anything they have previously experienced, right? Their brains are going to be looking for an appropriate network to help them make sense of or construct meaning from this information. And if nothing can be found, the information is discarded as meaningless. And we have to honestly ask ourselves as teachers, is it possible that much of what is being taught in schools fits this description? If so, then we shouldn't be surprised when our students' brains refuse to attend to the information being taught. We have to make it relevant. We have to hook it to something previous in their brain, right? This is why courses have prerequisites. I'm going to share some various strategies a little later that we can all employ as teachers and instructors to make information more meaningful. But right now, I want to move on to a second factor that has an equal, if not greater, impact on intention, and that's emotion. There's an old saying that emotion drives attention and attention drives learning. And to a large degree, this appears to be true. Understanding why, however, will require us to look more carefully at several subcortical structures that control emotional responses. So earlier we talked about that the brain is constantly scanning its environment, sifting and sorting through the incoming information to determine what to keep and what to ignore. Well, why does this occur? As mentioned, it occurs because it's essential for the survival of the individual and of the species. Think about it. If a dangerous animal were charging towards you and your brain decided to focus on, hmm, what's the rate of speed of that animal? Or, wow, wonder what classification this animal falls within the animal kingdom. Well, you wouldn't be around too long to later pass on your genes because the animal would kill you, right? Therefore, it's imperative that we possess a system that quickly separates the essential from the frivolous. And we actually, of course, do. And at one time, the system was called the limbic system. But over time, this term proved to be somewhat limiting and perhaps even inaccurate. And that's because scientists disagree about which structures actually compose this system. And more importantly, they disagree over whether it is even a system. But perhaps the terminology isn't that important. And what is important is that a group of structures work together to help us focus on those aspects of environmental input that are critical to our survival. And the first of these structures is the thalamus, a sort of relay station that receives information and sends it on to the appropriate part of the cortex for further processing. At the same time, however, this information is also being sent to the amygdala, 
Why two? Well, it's as if this message is duplicated so it can be sent to different areas of the brain simultaneously. Well, why are our brains designed for this type of parallel processing? Well, as you may recall from previous podcast episodes, when I spoke about the amygdala, I told you that it determines the emotional relevance of incoming stimuli. It is responsible for the immediate responses to questions such as, is this something that could hurt me? Or should I run away from this or should I run towards it? Conversely, the cortex processes incoming stimuli rationally. It places the information in context to make sense of it and decide on a course of action. Therefore, it may not come as a surprise that the pathway between the thalamus and the amygdala is much shorter than the pathway between the thalamus and the cortex. In fact, the thalamus amygdala pathway is one synapse long allowing the amygdala to receive the information approximately a quarter of a second sooner than the cortex. Well, why do we want it to go there before it hits the cortex? Well, the cortex provides a more accurate representation of the stimulus, but it takes much longer to do so. And if there is potential danger, time is of the essence. You don't want to be taking it that long to decide if this is going to hurt you. In his book, The Emotional Brain, Joseph Ladoy, Ladox, Ledoux, I guess it is, called the thalamus amygdala pathway the quick and dirty root, which signifies the often less than rational response the brain makes in emotional situations. Understanding this unconscious emotional response system, this quick and dirty root, also helps explain the less than rational reaction we sometimes observe in our students who are confronted with situations that their brains perceive to be emotionally attention-getting. And we're going to talk about that. So the brain is biologically programmed to attend to information that has strong emotional content first. It is also programmed to remember this information longer. Our brains and our students' brains are designed to pay attention to not only physical dangers in the environment, but facial expressions and other components of body language that contain emotional information necessary for survival. So, in summary, all the stimuli that is constantly bombarding our senses successfully finds their way into our brains, but few remain there for very long. As educators, we need to be aware of this process that occurs in the brain during this initial sifting and sorting stage. Cognizant of the roles that both meaning and emotion play is critical to understanding why the brain pays attention to some stimuli and not to others. If students do not pay attention to what is being taught, or if they pay attention to something else, there is little chance that they will learn what is being taught. Remember, attention drives learning. And in the next episode, I'm going to be talking about working memory. But that is all the time we have for this episode of the Chef Educator Podcast, and I hope you enjoyed it. Your feedback and comments are always welcome as they help us in making the best show possible. So please, let us know what you think. You can email us your thoughts, suggestions, comments, and testimonials, good or bad, to foodmedianetwork at gmail.com, or even leave us a voicemail on our audience response hotline at area code 207 835-1275. And don't forget to buy us a cup of coffee or two. You can do that at www.buymeacoffee.com slash Chef Roach or through Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Dr. Professor Chef. We truly appreciate any help you can provide. Well, until we meet again, keep learning, keep teaching, and keep cooking. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. The Chef Educator Podcast is a proud member of the Food Media Network.